I'm Tyler McBrien, Managing Editor of Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive from May 29th, 2023. Last week, Russia took control over the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut with the help of Yevgeny Prigozhin, founder and leader of the Wagner Mercenary Group, which has been assisting Russia with its war in Ukraine. But the victory seemed fleeting for Prigozhin, who gave a lengthy interview to a pro-war Russian blogger, saying that Russia's war might backfire. In the interview, Prigozhin reaffirmed his loyalty to Putin, but expressed concerns about the way the Kremlin is approaching the war in Ukraine. For today's episode, I chose an episode from January 20th, 2018 about Putin, in which The Guardian's Moscow correspondent Sean Walker joined special guest host Alina Polyakova to discuss his book, The Long Hangover, Putin's New Russia and the Ghosts of the Past. They discussed Putin's use of Russian history as political strategy, the changing landscape of Russia's lesser known cities since the 1990s, and much more. I'm Alina Polyakova, and this is the Lawfare Podcast for January 20th, 2018. Last week, Moscow correspondent for The Guardian, Sean Walker, joined me to discuss his new book, The Long Hangover, Putin's New Russia and the Ghosts of the Past. Sean has spent the last 10 years reporting from Russia. So what does he know that we don't about what average Russians think of Putin and the regime he has set up? Well, we're about to find out. It's the Lawfare Podcast, episode 277, Sean Walker on Russia's Long Hangover. Sean, welcome to the Lawfare Podcast. It's great to have you. Hi, it's great to be here. So, Sean, you just published a new book called The Long Hangover, Putin's New Russia and the Ghosts of the Past, just out this month with Oxford University Press. For those of our listeners who've been following Russia, you may not need a formal introduction. You've been uh, reporting out of Moscow for 14 years now. Um, I've been following your writing in The Guardian for much of that time. Uh, Your rants about your hate for Dill, which I don't personally agree with because as a proper Eastern European, I love Dill. Uh, But, you know, we can agree to disagree there. But I'm glad that we caught you while you were on your uh, brief visit to D.C., the book is, I just started reading, I just got it this morning, uh, very well written, as to be expected, um, and I think comes out at just the right moment. So uh, let's just chat a little bit about the book. Um, th- I was curious to get your thoughts on the title, The Long Hangover, because The Long Hangover implies that there was some really fun party the night before <laughs> that you're now in a hangover from. But I don't really get the sense from the book so far that there was a fun party at some point. So you know, t- tell us a little bit about you know why the title, what you're trying to do with this book. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you obviously have a very optimistic view on life if you think you can only have a hangover from a fun party. I think you can, <laughs> you can also have a hangover from a terrible party. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the book... Uh, what I was trying to do and what the title refers to is to try to kind of put the Putin period and especially the last few years of this kind of resurgent Russia into the longer historical arc and to kind of place Putin uh, and Putin's mission uh, to kind of create this new identity for Russia, to create some kind of sense of nation, to put that into the arc of of the sort of post-Soviet period. And to sort of, you know, a lot of people have have kind of looked and looked at this really kind of cataclysmic event that happens in 1991, right? I mean, the writing of Svetlana Alexeyevich is is all about this uh, this sort of lost post-Soviet person and who they're supposed to be. Taking 1991 as this starting point, where you know Russians lose their empire, they lose uh, their ideology, and they lose their actual home country, the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, there may not have been very many committed communists at that point, but um, but nevertheless, you know, you hear from a lot of people that it, it just creates sudden, nobody expected the, their homeland to disappear, even if they weren't ideological communists. Uh, and so by the time Putin comes into power 10 years later, he's sort of faced with this this new Russia that nobody quite knows what it's for, what it's supposed to be. Uh, and he has this task of, of kind of creating a new sense of nation. So the book is, I guess, you know, it's called The Long Hangover, but it's really about the attempts to sort of get through this hangover. Um, and, you know, my theory, the main theory of the book is that Putin uh, uses uh, a sort of simplified version of, of 
Russian history and especially the victory in the Second World War as the kind of building block of, of this nation, this new sense of Russia, and that this all really comes to a head in 2014 uh, with uh, what we see happening in, in Kiev, in Crimea, uh, in eastern Ukraine. So that, that would be the sort of the brief summary. Well, you know, what I found interesting in um, the opening chapters of your book is that you really talk about this idea of the lost generation, right? The, these people um, who never quite found their place in whatever this new Russia was supposed to be. And I think in some ways this book is really different than many other books that are coming out on who, who Putin is or you know, the Kremlin and all of these different things today um, is that you kind of try to tell the stories from the eyes of those individuals from all your time spent uh, traveling around Russia outside of Moscow. Is there, you know, maybe from all the stories that you tell and all the interviews you've collected for this book, is there one uh, that really stands out to you as kind of epitomizing this lost generation experience and you know, outside of, I think, the major cities? Is there a specific example uh, that comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, as you say, I think um, Vladimir Putin is like one character in this book. He's not the main character. And I think uh, of all the stories that uh, of other people that I tell, uh, I think one of the ones that I found the most interesting was uh, Alexander Khodakovsky, uh, who was, uh, you know, he's not actually a Russian, he's a Ukrainian. Um, but this, the, the final part of the book is, is, is focused on, on what happened in 2014. And he became the sort of number two guy in the so-called Donetsk People's Republic, this um, sort of separatist state that was backed by Russia that sprung up in, in eastern Ukraine, as you know. And I found, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time talking to him. Uh, obviously, I don't sort of, there's a lot of things uh, about him that I don't like, and we certainly don't agree sort of politically, but I found him a very, very interesting character. And, and one of the things I tried to do in the book was to sort of let people speak for themselves, even if kind of I don't personally find their views very palatable, uh, to try and kind of explain where they were coming from, whether they're sort of, you know, fighters in one of Kadyrov's battalions or or someone like Khodakovsky. And he was, you know, unlike a lot of the people that ended up uh, running the Donetsk and Lugansk separatist movements who were just sort of basically... Uh, put in place by Russia. Uh, Khodorkovsky was a local. Uh, he was born in Donbass, uh, near Donetsk. Um, and he was he was born in the um, early 70s, I guess. And so he was just doing his military service uh, in the early 90s. Uh, and he was doing that in a paratrooper unit uh, near Moscow. And his unit was one of the units that was sent uh, supposedly to storm the White House. Um, and was called off at the last minute uh, in 1991. And so he sort of, you know, his formative experience was serving this country that sort of disintegrated before his eyes uh, when he was, I think, 21. Uh, and he later went on, he came back to, to Donetsk. He wanted to, he'd always dreamed of uh, being in the KGB or being in the border guards. And then, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed and he went back to Donetsk and he found himself in this, you know, independent Ukraine that he didn't really understand and he didn't identify with. Um, but he joined the Ukrainian special forces. He was in the SBU. He, he ran the... The SBU is the Ukrainian uh, Secret Security Service. Services, Security yeah. Services. Mm -hmm. And he, he ran the, the alpha unit of the SBU in Donetsk, which was the sort of the special forces branch of the security services. Uh, and so then, you know, he was on Maidan in the Orange Revolution, during the Orange Revolution from the side of the, the government. And he was again on the second Maidan in 2014. Uh, from the side of the Yanukovych authorities. Mm. You know, I found him uh, a really interesting kind of interlocutor um, about his views of, of, of sort of why why he felt that, uh, you know, why he'd taken the decisions he'd taken and why he ended up um, basically the number two person in this really quite unsavory um, political structure. So I think, you know, in all, in all the stories that come out, what's... what's compelling is this desire by these individuals like, like the one you just told us about to have a connection to some sense of belonging right to some vision of what their country represents and it, to many of them it's not that they want the soviet union back 
right? But they want some of the elements of that system back in the sense that you know the greatness that the um, Soviet Union held on the world stage, right? Uh, the greatness that the Russian Empire held on the world stage, the sense of pride over their homeland that in some ways, you know, when the Soviet Union fell apart to many of these people in this generation, what came to replace it wasn't at all analogous to what was lost. So it's like this profound sense of loss that still permeates these people's identities. And it seems like they're searching and, and looking for an expression of their identity in, in these various ways that lead them to decisions like, like the one you just described, to be on sort of the wrong side of history, basically, in the Ukrainian context, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think that's right. And I think it works on the kind of uh, when you're talking about that loss of importance or that loss of purpose, you know, it works on a kind of macro level with in terms of the, the country, this feeling of belonging to something that, that's, you know, a, a, a big, uh, important thing. And, you know, one of the one of the sort of starting points of the book uh, is is an article that Putin wrote in 1999, just a few days before he was made acting president, uh, where he says, you know, Russia for the first time in 200 to 300 years, uh, risks becoming a second tier or even a third tier country. Uh, and he kind of calls on Russians to unite um, to make Russia a first tier, to ensure that Russia remains a first tier country. And you kind of, you know, he writes about a lot of things in this in this kind of programmatic article, he talks about the economy, he talks about uh, society and, and sort of social issues. But you get this sense that he sort of feels that if, if Russia can be a first tier country, all these other things will kind of take care of themselves and sort of taps into that long line of Russian thinking where the sort of state is is more important, you know, the health of the state is more important than the health of the individual. And then I think it also works on the micro level. So you have a lot of people who lost their way personally, who felt that all the things that made up their, you know, whether it's you know, the status of life, the language, the way that people interacted with each other, the things that were important, the things that you got accolades for, suddenly all of this disappears and this system that everybody was, maybe they didn't like it, maybe they didn't didn't quite know where they were going, but they at least understood the sort of terrain that they were walking on. And suddenly that changes. Uh, and, you, you know, I saw it, I think, particularly... Um, you know, I mentioned in the book that I, you know, there are a lot of angry men in the pages mm -hmm. of this book. Uh, and it seems like, you know, there's this particular kind of person who was coming of age around the time was, you know, teens, early 20s, late 20s, around the time of the Soviet collapse. Um, there are three, in fact, commanders from the, the East Ukraine war uh, in the book. And they're all, they all sort of fit that profile of people who were sort of just just coming of age and had this sort of sudden feeling that, that everything had been taken away from them uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. So one thing you said in, in, in your remarks just now that I think is, is important to pull out a little bit is how you describe Putin as somebody who really focuses on the status of the nation state, not the status of the individual in Russia, which I think is, is a difficult worldview for many in the West to understand, where uh, especially in the United States, uh, we're going to be pretty obsessed with our individual rights and that national interest should be you know, promoting the rights and the freedoms and liberties of the individual citizen, right? Which is completely the different orientation than what exists in Russia today and what exists in the Soviet Union as well, right? That it's really about the interests of the state and not the interests of the people, which I think in some ways also explains a lot of the foreign policy decisions that Putin took since coming to power in the year 2000. Um, they certainly haven't served the Russian people, who, in your descriptions, remain you know, relatively poor outside of Moscow, St. Petersburg, and some major cities. Um, but they have certainly, these decisions have certainly propelled Russia back on the world stage, especially over the last you know, five, five, six years. I want to start to get into a little bit more nitty-gritty of your actual experience living in Russia. Um, you first came to Russia in the year 2000 as a as a young uh, high school graduate, is that right? Exactly, yeah. It was like a year between uh, high school and university. Yeah. Um, and then got hooked on it and came back later and eventually became the, the correspondent for The Guardian where you've been for, has it been a decade? Uh, it's been four and a half years at The Guardian, before that six yep. years at The Independent. Yeah, yeah so 10 years spent uh, uh, reporting out, out yeah. of Russia. So you basically have spanned the entire era of Putin from the year 2000. And you've traveled all over the country. Are there things that um, surprised you in, in that time period, um, in the way the country transformed itself? What, are there specific, I guess, 
elements of the, the Putinist era that you found surprising as you were living through it in, in some ways? I mean, yeah, all sorts of things, I guess. I think, so I, yeah, I moved back to Moscow. Um, so I was there for that six month period in 2000. And then I went and I studied kind of Russian and Soviet history at university. And I moved back at the end of 2003. And I think already by that point, things were changing a bit. Uh, you know, when I was in Moscow in 2000, it really was still quite a kind of dark and chaotic place. Uh, you know, the, you would see sort of right on the on the garden ring in the center of Moscow, you'd see sort of prostitutes hanging around. This level of just extreme poverty and the sort of, you know, terrible things you would see of kind of elderly people with nothing kind of begging on the streets and things was really quite shocking. And by 2000, by the end of 2003, that that was already changing. And and through this whole period up to kind of 2012 or so, you did get this gradual sense of improvement that things, especially in the cities, were getting better. Uh, and you know, even if you went to to sort of second tier cities, like uh, you know, I remember for going to somewhere like Murmansk around 2003 and just thinking it was the most miserable place I've ever been. <laughs> in the far north. Yeah, in the far north, exactly. Um, and then going back there um, maybe sort of six or seven years later, and I mean, of course, it, it hadn't transformed into uh, into the sort of south of France, but, uh, you know, there was a shopping mall and there was a cinema and people seemed to have things to do. Uh, and this kind of trickle down wealth, you know, because the oil prices were so high, there was so much money coming into the country. And although the sort of system uh, was kind of broken and there was all kinds of corruption, there was enough money that this sort of did trickle down and way more people had the chance to travel. And that sort of, you know, bought, I think, a lot of time for, for the kind of Putin regime. Uh, so, you know, and then, of course, things change and, and you know, you, you start seeing the economic tail off, you start seeing Putin's approval ratings dropping. Uh, and then suddenly, uh, when Putin comes back to the, the Kremlin in 2012, you have this much more ideological nationalist kind of um, uh, tenure of, 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 of politics, which sort of seems to come to its logical mm -hmm. conclusion in, in 2014. So yeah, I mean, it's 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 a really you know clearly it's really it's 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 such a big and and kind of difficult legacy that came from the Soviet Union. So you go somewhere, you know, one of the chapters in the book is is about Magadan, uh, which is the region in the far east of Russia, where which is the the major Gulag region, uh, and you go to a lot of these settlements in places like that, or even to be honest, in places like p parts of eastern Ukraine, where where sort of separatist movements would take hold, and you look at these sort of quite desolate post-industrial landscapes and you kind of think you know this is all this stuff was all built for an economy that didn't really work the, you know the Soviet Union is disintegrated the planned economy is no longer there all these plants that were competitive within this kind of uh, big system that you know the orders came from the plants mm -hmm. in East Ukraine from the the plants in Siberia and it all kind of fit together that's not there anymore these things can't be competitive on the international stage uh, and you just think there's nothing there's no possible way that somewhere like you know the the towns of Magadan region or even some of those towns in East Ukraine you, you just can't quite imagine how these are ever going to become prosperous and pleasant places um, so you know even while even while the sort of the overall standard of living is rising, you have these whole chunks of the country where people essentially think back to the 60s or the 70s or the early 80s um, and kind of, of course, they, they view that through their dis disaffections of the present. They have an idealized version of the past, as, as people often do. Um, but, but sort of you still have this really powerful uh, sense of nostalgia um, among large swathes of the population, even as, you know, in Moscow, you're, you've got sort of hipster coffee shops and cafes mm -hmm. and restaurants and so on. I mean, I think one question that often gets asked about Russia's, I think, quite uh, depressing economic outlook for the years to come in mean, the Russian economy is not projected to grow more than 1, 1 1.5% in the near term. It certainly entered a stage of you know, stagnation, and the economic pie seems to be getting smaller and smaller, partly because of sanctions, but mostly because of you know lower oil prices and just the inability of the Russian state to actually diversify the economy away from hydrocarbons and uh, military sales, basically, which is not the kind of economy that's going to take you to the 
to through the rest of the 21st century, it seems, mm-hmm. right? So the question that often gets asked, you know, how is there a point where the economic situation gets so bad or things are not improving for so long that people who are most affected by this decline, so people in these smaller towns, not um, in these richer uh urban uh, metropolitan areas like Moscow, St. Petersburg. Um, is there a low point where people get so frustrated those frustrations come out in some sort of political protest um, and some sort of grassroots uprising? And you spent a lot of time in these regions. What's your sense of that? Yeah, I mean, I think the the feeling is that, that, of course, and the reason that we've seen so little protest in Russia is just this this overwhelming sense that um, that you know nothing can be changed by protesting, and that's obviously you know that's obviously something that the the Putin regime has has done a, a lot of work to sort of uh, promote as an idea, and a lot of work to actually make that a self fulfilling prophecy that the way that the system is now built, uh, you know, any kind of to demanding any kind of change. Um, possibly would involve kind of uprisings and then who knows sort of what happens so and, and you know and they've also played very well uh again looking back into the, going back into this sort of use of history you know they've played off these ideas of 1917 and 1991 as these kind of two cataclysmic events in russian history and you know, trying to sort of instill in people this idea that you know revolutionary change or kind of uprising is, is always wrong of course that's the, the question of like where does the point come where people feel they have less to lose by protesting than they do by not protesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think that's why we've seen this, you know, we've, we've obviously seen these urban protests mainly in Russia, right? And obviously the, the, the main ones came in the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. Mm-hmm. And those were mainly the people who had traveled, who'd seen the West. Uh, and when the crackdown came, you know, they kind of dissolved because I think people realized they did have that, you know, they, they had they had things to lose and they they weren't if you're just, you know, if the regime is going to sort of selectively imprison a few dozen people and by going to the protests, you risk becoming one of those. Uh, I think most of those people took the decision that it kind of wasn't worth it. So far, we haven't seen uh, we haven't seen in these sort of smaller towns. Uh, any ability to organize. There's no real sense of civil society or grassroots right. organizations that would kind of put any kind of momentum together. Uh, I mean, I do think that the potential is there. I do think, you know, the, obviously there's this big question now about someone like Alexei Navalny and, and how much he's capable of, of motivating people. You know, you talk to pro-Kremlin people and they will point out that opinion polls only give him 2%. Uh, and that you know, outside the big cities, people are, he's not very popular, and people do have this this view that he's a Western agent, and all protest is sort of serving the goals of the West, trying to destabilize Russia. Um, but I do think part of the part of the success of of Putin and the Kremlin of preventing these protests has been by really just burning the field and making sure there's no there's, there's no sort of viable options um and if someone like navalny is able to sort of come through that and really access people using the internet using the word of mouth um then you know the the sort of the the last few months traveling around russia i've sort of just felt like i could feel those sort of small shoots of kind of grass coming Mm. through of of people uh, that you wouldn't expect to be interested in someone like Navalny if when they're exposed to it, kind of find being quite receptive. You mean older people, so not not the young, kind of internet savvy people or people you don't expect. Um, who who are those people? Um, so I spent, I went off to Kemerova, which is this kind of grimy mining town in Siberia. Um, a couple of months ago to spend a couple of days with uh, the people who are running Navalny's kind of a campaign headquarters. Mm-hmm. So, you know, of course, even though he's not going to be able to stand in the election, he's been running this campaign across Russia. He's been sort of trying to do real politics, which is something that kind of hasn't really been done in Russia in recent years. And so his, his sort of campaign HQ in this town was run by uh, a 23-year-old young woman and she'd had, you know, she'd had all kinds of problems once she started trying to set this this up. There were posters that were posted around the town with her mobile number and face kind of saying, call this mm. number for sex. Uh, her mother had been wow. fired from her job at a music school where she'd worked for 26 years. Her grandmother even, who worked as sort of in an art gallery, had been told she had to 
you know, stop her granddaughter from doing this kind of activity or she'd be fired. So it's this really kind of, you know, draconian um, response. And so I went to see her and I met with her and her mother. And the mother was telling me how, you know, she was... She'd always been a big fan of Putin. She used to buy Putin calendars for her daughter. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, when this first started, she was kind of very suspicious about why her daughter was involved with this strange opposition politician. Uh, and she said, I mean, you know what? You know, then Ksenia started showing me the videos and I started watching them and I realized Navalny's right. And, you know, I, I suddenly realized she's doing the right thing. Uh, and then there were a few other much younger kids who were helping out at this this headquarters. They were sort of 14, 15. And one of those was also saying to me, you know, my, when I first started going to the Navalny protest, the sort of child, child support agency branch of the police came to my house and my parents were furious and I was grounded. Uh, and then I just forced my mum to start watching the videos and now she's really into it. And, you know, she showed me this picture that when Navalny had come to Kemerova, um, his mum was there, like, grinning and taking a selfie with him. So, you know, I mean, this is, of course, a very small sample, but I found it quite interesting. There was this almost mm-hmm. this reverse thing of, of sort of children feeling like they were the responsible people kind of educating their parents about politics. Uh, and, you know, even in a place like Kemerova, which... Uh, you know, there's been even in 2011, 2012, when those Moscow protests happened, you know, mm-hmm. 40 or 50 people showed up in Kemerova. Uh, when Navalny went to do his rally there, they had about 2000. So, you know, in a city of, I think, 500,000, there's not very many, but it's still given all of these sort of, you know, pressure on people and the fact that if you go, who knows what might happen to you in terms of, you know, problems at work or problems at college. That's actually quite a big number. And I think it's it's quite worrying for the Kremlin going forward. Of course, Navalny is not someone across the country because he does not have access to television Mm -hmm. and basically blocked out of any resources that he would have uh, if this was an actual democracy to campaign. And many Russians still get most of their news and information from television. And, you know, he never appears there. He's sort of a taboo name. Um, And also in the newspapers and all state-controlled media outlets. So I I, I like the story that you just told us about the younger generation trying to inform their parents and that their parents and their grandparents are convinced by some of these arguments. Um, So is that fear that if Navalny is actually allowed, was allowed to run by the Kremlin, that he would actually be able to mobilize this lost generation, right? These individuals who, you know, believe in Putin because that's the only thing there is to believe in, really. Mm -hmm. There's no other option that's real um, in Russia today. Is it this fear that drove the Kremlin to block Navalny from running or was, was it something else? So, I mean, I think there I think there are different people around the Kremlin with different ideas on this. And, you know, there was there was, as far as I understand, a fairly serious discussion about whether or not to let him run, uh, in which some people thought that he should be allowed to run. Ever since he appeared, there's been these this this sort of argument about do you let him stand uh, like they did in the 2013 uh, Moscow mayoral Mm -hmm. elections. And the idea was, you know, he's he's got his he's got his liberal demographic. They'll vote for him. He'll lose. We'll you know we'll make the elections more legitimate by kind of showing that. Uh, you know, in Moscow he got twenty seven percent, which you know for someone who who wasn't uh, wasn't given a real campaign platform was pretty impressive. Um, and I think that worried a lot of people. But at the same time, you know, they haven't wanted to actually put him in jail. So you know, we've had this on and off thing where one minute he's allowed in elections the next minute he's under house arrest his brother's in jail uh, but i but to answer your question directly i mean i know i don't think i don't think the kremlin is scared that if they let him into the elections he would do incredibly well uh, although i think they maybe should be more scared than they are i think the reason that they don't want him to run is simply that you know he doesn't play by the rules mm-hmm. his attacks on Putin, his attacks on the system uh, are are sort of really vicious. Um, You know, there's no real, there's no real way for them to come, you know, if people come at them with arguments about liberal politics, then they can come back and say, well, that's not what the Russian people want. And they can, uh, you know, have have a sort of political debate. But if they come, if Navalny comes at them with, you know, this is the dacha worth, you know, $50 million of 
Putin's childhood friend, and this is the London apartment of Shivalov, and etc. And this is the watch of Peskov. You know, and how do these people have all this money? And why is Putin portraying himself as fighting corruption when all of his friends and his partners and his uh, close associates have have billions? That's, I mean, there's no answer to that. Um, so it's it's it. So I I think what somebody who was involved in in sort of discussions around whether to let him run said to me was, you know, I. I don't think he would get more than 3% of the vote, but it just would be unpleasant. He'd be pouring dirt over the elections, and we don't need yeah. dirt in these elections. Uh, Airing the dirty laundry, so to say. Exactly, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, probably if, 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 if tomorrow the decision was made that he could run uh, and he was given, you know, total access to all the TV, I'm sure Putin probably would still win. But in the sort of medium term, I think he is quite dangerous for them in a way that kind of previous opposition politicians in Russia haven't been. I think what's interesting to me about the kind of political climate that you describe in Russia today is that Putin almost seems like he doesn't want to even run his own (laughs) campaign. He seems quite disengaged. He's made a couple of statements, but he hasn't presented any sort of vision for his next six years, which, of course, are sure the elections in Russia are not real elections, um, as people know. Um, it's sort of just a, a renewal of his mandate. And, you know, it's this kind of malaise, right, that seems to define yeah. Russia today. Um, and I would imagine that for your average um, you know, young Russian <laughs> or even someone in this older generation, I mean, how much more of that can you really live with and, you know, without wanting something else? And speaking of that something else, I mean, Xenia Subchuk uh, seems to be presented as that something else. Um, is she a real candidate or is this all just Kremlin kabuki theater? Uh, yeah, I think the latter. Uh, and, you know, to uh, your question of how much more can people put up with until they want something else, I mean, I think, you know, the point is that they're not offered anything else right. so yeah i'm uh you know i think these these sort of very high approval ratings for putin are genuine but they're quite fragile because they're predicated on putin being you know the only option of course if it's either putin or revolution and upheaval right. of course we'll support putin to come to Subchak, you know i i went to speak to her um, the day after she announced her candidacy, um, and I found her fairly unconvincing. As uh, you know, she uh, she insisted that um, it was entirely her decision that she hadn't kind of discussed it with anyone or asked permission. I don't think that's true. Um, I think you know, I think there is there is some part of her that was clearly interested in doing this for her own promotion or her own future career, but uh, and. You know, I, some of the issues she's raised during the campaign have been useful, but I don't think she's a very serious candidate. And I don't even think she has, you know, we saw the Kremlin do this six years ago in the 2012 elections with Mikhail Prokhorov, yes. the oligarch, um, who was basically asked to run as this sort of liberal candidate. Uh, and he got quite into the, you know, he was asked to run, but he got quite into the role. He didn't directly criticize Putin. That was part of the deal. But he went and, you know, gave a lot of speeches about how Russia needed, you know, new direction, new ideas. And he won quite a lot of support. You know, he did really well in Moscow. Uh, a lot of young people I spoke to got quite enthused by him. Uh, and, you know, as often happens with uh, sort of things that are conjured up into the political matrix in Russia when they get too successful, they're sort of quietly withdrawn again. Uh, and that's what we saw happen with Prokhorov. Uh, this time, Subchak feels a bit like a sort of mm-hmm. pale imitation, um, you know, an imitation of the imitation, if you like. Um, and, you know, she, I think the sort of natural urban liberal minority who would be um, likely to support her uh, or to support an opposition candidate feel that she's you know too much of a fake and and very disingenuous and i think she also has uh not much broader appeal to right. sort of outside that that traditional group so i yeah I, it it seems a, a fairly sort of sorry attempt really to to kind of put up a, a a liberal opposition candidate the illusion of choice right yeah so i want to go back to 2014 uh that you keep coming back to as this pivotal moment uh for putin for russia um uh, of course is the annexation of crimea 
uh, Russia's invasion of eastern Ukraine. Um, of course, you were in Russia when this was all happening. You were on the Maidan in Ukraine when the protests began in 2013. Um, you know, now with, in hindsight, a lot of people say, well, we saw Crimea coming. That was an obvious uh, move uh, by Putin. Uh, was it your sense that in Russia people saw this coming? Or did it really take you and others by surprise? Um, well, I think I'd answer that in, in two ways. So I think, you know, the, the plan the plan to uh, the sort of annexation plan p probably existed on the shelf uh, somewhere um, but I think there are a lot of plans that exist on the shelf that don't necessarily ever come off the shelf um, so you know one of the scenes I describe in the book um, is uh, you know each year uh, in September the the Ukrainian oligarch Viktor Pinchuk has this conference uh, in Yalta well it's now in Kiev but but uh, of the annexation, but the the, two, the last one that was in Crimea in September 2013 that I went to, and there was this big discussion going on uh, about whether or not Ukraine would sign the association agreement with the European Union. And you know, I'd watched this discussion over the years get sort of nastier and nastier. And at the 2013 conference, uh, Sergei Glazyev, who was this kind of uh, you know fairly hardline advisor to the Kremlin uh, was dispatched by Russia and and sort of took part in this very bad tempered session uh, between him Poroshenko um, people like Radek Sikorsky who were there and you know, he was kind of laughed the out of the room Minister of Poland. yeah mm -hmm. yeah uh, he was sort of laughed out of the room um, and afterwards I I went to speak to him and I started asking him questions and he 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 sort of spoke in this sort of quite sinister, quiet way about all the sort of problems Ukraine would have if uh, if they signed this agreement. Uh, and I started asking him, you know, well, what would happen in your view? He was saying that there would be all kinds of social unrest in eastern Ukraine and in Crimea um, if, if Ukraine signed this agreement rather than signing the agreement Russia wanted them to sign with the, the customs union with Russia. And I said, well, so imagine a situation where this has happened and these uprisings have happened. Do you think Russia would, you know, would Russia potentially support those uprisings? Uh, and he said, you know, well, uh, Russia supports Ukraine's territorial integrity for now. <laughs> uh, and at the, at the time, mm. I kind of thought, you know, I, I mean, this was my ridiculous scenario that I've pushed on him. Uh, you know, it was about a week after I started at The Guardian. And I, I sort of, mm. you know, I, I wrote it up as a story, but I slightly held back from sort of running it as, you know, Kremlin official threatens to annex parts of Ukraine. Right, right. Um, and, you know, and I think at that point, Glazev was quite a marginal voice. I think there were different voices in the Kremlin. But that was the sort of sense that, you know, this this plan definitely was there. People had suggested that it might have been something that was kept in reserve for what, you know, Russia was expecting Yanukovych to lose the, the presidential elections in 2015. It was a sort of, you know, crisis scenario that could yep. be put into play. Uh, and then it was, you know, when this when the Maidan happened, um, it was sort of put, put in place ahead of time. So, you know, to answer your question, yes and no. I mean, I, I don't think this was something that uh, had been planned for a long time and was kind of inevitable. And, you know, Georgia was the warning and, and Crimea was the logical next step. Mm -hmm. But I do think it was probably something that, that was sort of considered as part of the arsenal. And the way that events moved led to this quite hard line uh, circle of sort of policy making coming into the ascendancy. And, you know, so you traveled to Crimea um, during the entire, you know, so-called, uh, quote-unquote, referendum process um, in 2014. Uh, last time you were there was three years ago? Yeah. Um, 2015. You know, Crimea has become this kind of black hole. We don't get a lot of information about what's happening there. You know, how do you even get there anymore if you're coming from Moscow as a, as a Westerner? You know, what do you do? Well, it's actually, I mean, yeah, it's its really quite tragic how undercovered Crimea is because, you know, some of the stuff happening there, particularly with the Crimean Tatar population, yep. is, is truly awful. And the problem with Crimea is that, uh, of course, because now Russia and Ukraine consider it to be part of their countries, uh, you have to, the, the problem for reporters like me uh, based in Moscow is that you have to get permission from the Ukrainian side. You have, you know, you have to, so to get, so to get from Crimea to Moscow, you can either take a two hour flight to Simferopol, but of course 
that by doing that you violate Ukrainian law. So instead you have to take an indirect flight to Kiev, then you have to get several permissions, which takes several days. Then you have to go overland to Kherson in the south of Ukraine. Then you have to take a car to the border where you get stopped and you get questioned by the FSB for hours about mm. why you're coming from the Ukrainian side and not from Moscow. Then you go from there to Simferopol. So, you know, it takes you about three or four days uh, each way to do this. And, you know, in unfortunately... Many people would think that, you know, we just, it's unfortunate we'd like to report from Crimea, we don't have that much time. And for the reporters based in Kiev, they don't have Russian foreign ministry accreditation. So, you know, they can go e much more easily from the Ukrainian side, but they can't, they're not going to be let in because they don't have a Russian journalist visa. I, I personally think the Ukrainians should make it much easier for reporters to go because I think, you know, the majority of coverage that's likely to come out of Crimea is is is, is going to be something that is, is not going to look good for Russia and, you know, terrible things are happening there. But unfortunately, because of, you know, because there are so many other stories with Russia at the moment, sort of deciding that you're going to spend sort of 10 days going to Crimea right. is not something that everyone can do. Right. But maybe when the land bridge comes, you yeah. know, there'll be hordes of Russians <laughs> uh, driving over the land bridge to Crimea, which uh, uh, for our audience that may not know, this is a really interesting project that you may want to look into um, that I think is close to being finished, the land bridge yeah. from Russia to the Crimean Peninsula. Um, Sean, I don't want to go too much of your time, but uh, starting a new uh, poll here on the special series of the Russia podcast, there's a lot of bad information about Ukraine, about Russia, or just bad news, disinformation in general in our media environment. So aside from The Guardian, which is a wonderful paper that uh, most people read anyways, um, you know, where do you get your news, English language news about Russia? Maybe some sources that not everybody knows about. That's a good question. I think English language news, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there are so there are there are a few uh, sort of news outlets in the region that um, have English language sort of subsets that are good. So the, the obvious one that springs to mind is Medusa, mm -hmm. um, which was you know used to be uh, uh, was the sort of rump of a of a very good Russian news website that had been closed down, and the editor in chief and a few reporters moved to Riga and sort of set it up as a kind of ex, uh, yep. news in exile. Um, so they do very, very good reporting on Russia. And I think, uh, you put me on the spot here. Well, you don't have to <laughs> yeah. answer that fully. I don't know, but yeah, even like yeah. Russian language news, really. I mean, there's plenty of people in the Russian diaspora community in the United States, in the West, that are beaming, you know, television straight from uh, Moscow still. Uh, but many are also reading stuff online. I mean, what, what would you read online that has, you know, good, independent, objective reporting in Russian? Uh, I think it's hard. I think that, you know, it's getting that, that though there were these small islands and they've continued to get smaller and smaller. Um, there are still some good Russian outlets. There's, uh, there's Erbeka, um, there's Medusa, as I've said. Um, there's a new startup called The Bell, which has some good reporting. In English language. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, there is an English language part of it as well. But yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. Um, and I think even among... You know, even among the the foreign reporting, of course, there's loads of really good reporters working um, on both Russia and Ukraine. Um, but part of the reason I wrote this book was that, you know, I felt that there was a sort of cathartic element to it that I felt that this the, the Russia and Ukraine story and the 2014 story was so complicated. Um, and of course, like Russian disinformation is huge. But I also felt that the other side, there was there was often a quite simplistic narrative on the other side. Uh, and I felt that, you know, I got so tired of having arguments with people about Ukraine that I felt like I just needed to like write down yep. what I'd seen over the years and what I kind of thought. So, I mean, it's not a it's not a, a polemic by any means. It's more just a sort of exposition of what I thought that, you know, at times I can't avoid making judgments on things. Um, but, yeah, it's 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 difficult and messy. Um, and, you know, I think getting it sort of the truth in inverted commas can be pretty difficult. Sean, I think you've done a great job with this book. Uh, you know, so far, from what I just got it today, but I will finish <laughs> reading it. Um, you know, I think telling the story of uh, this Putin era through the eyes of the Russians that you've met and the Ukrainians that you've met, um, especially during this really complicated period of Russia-US, Russia-West relations. So congratulations on the book. 
Thank you. Um, thank you for coming by the podcast, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for having me. See you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please take a moment to tweet the Lawfare Podcast, share it on Facebook, Twitter, or talk about it over some vodka, but not too much. And give it a rating on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever podcast distribution system you may use. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. I'm Alina Poyakova. Thanks for listening.